see the Lord seated on the throne, exalted, and the train of his robe filled the temple with glory, and the whole earth is filled, and the Today, as you notice, there's a trumpet sitting up there on the, on the stage, on the podium there, on the, on the platform. Beautiful golden trumpet. And um, I look forward at that final trumpet blast when Jesus returns. No matter how long you've been part of the faith and how long you've walked with Jesus, that you probably have a sense of looking forward to Jesus' return, as I have. Um, I suppose as we do Bible study and we look at Daniel, we look at Matthew chapter 25, Matthew 24 as well, we look at Revelation, we get a sense of where we might be in this journey on human existence as God is the potter moulding and shaping us and how the imminency of God's word is going to be fulfilled and what a joyous and certain hope that we have as sojourners in this world. Perhaps like the Apostle Paul, like the saints preceded us, that we might see Jesus in our lifetime. And this, this is quite true when you look at the nature of since the 1960s with the nuclear arms race, with biological weapons that are sitting in factories and the scary things and the wicked things that people do. The challenge with, for me, as a boy growing up, aware, and I'm blessed to be a part of the body of Christ, was that I focused more on the nasty things that would return, happen until Jesus returned, to what called the Great Tribulation, but I didn't know Jesus on a deep personal covenant relationship, to be the counterbalance from what I knew what the Bible told us was going to happen. And I think for all of us, Jesus prayed in John chapter 17, he first prays for himself, he prays for his disciples, and then he prays for all those who believe on account of their testimony. And you and I are here today based on their testimony. And so the writings of the Apostle John especially can bring us closer to Jesus, that we are not only, we, we share in John's empath, his love for the Lord, he describes himself as a disciple whom Jesus loved. Do you describe yourself as that, in terms of your relationship with Jesus? And so through the testimony of the faithful people, we can be drawn closer to Jesus Christ. And, and John takes us right to the heart and core of the hope that he had in his Saviour. You know, the Lord's Supper, Jesus, John had his head resting on Jesus' breast. You know, we all have our personal space. And gee, John wanted to get as close as he could to Jesus on a physical level. Very, very powerful. Um, and then John, some years later, 20, 25, some people think 30. I've seen some people have think it was written many, much more later than that. But John writes something that Jesus said in John chapter 5, verse 28. He says, and this is Jesus' words, don't marvel at this. Now elsewhere Jesus says that you may marvel, but here that Jesus says, don't marvel at this, for an hour is coming when all who are in the tombs will hear his voice. If you read it in context, it's about Jesus, return, judgment and justice and the reality of, the, of what's going to happen. Verse 29, will hear his voice and come out those who've done good to the resurrection of life. And that's what you and I look forward to. When we hear that last trumpet blast, and those who've done evil to resurrection of judgment. You read the scriptures, you recognise the resurrection to judgment occurs a thousand years later at the great white throne judgment. Those words from John chapter 5, verse 28 and 29 are very powerful, extraordinarily authoritative, very compelling and filled with awesome hope. And I encourage you to read that, copy that, frame it into a picture and hang it in your home. Because you and I look forward to that very, very powerfully. Paul describes it in even greater detail. I'm going to bring it up on the screen again. And this is the one that we read earlier today. I don't want you to be uninformed, brothers, about those who are asleep. Because you can stand at the graveside or you can be listening to a... I remember going to a funeral and there was a Buddhist monk and a Christian pastor. And both at the same funeral for the same deceased gave totally opposite messages. So people are standing there, wow, what do I believe? 
And then the, the tertiary institutions say, well, we don't believe it's a lot of rubbish. We all evolved through random happenstance. He says, I don't want you to be ignorant about those who've fallen asleep. That you may not grieve at others who do, who have no hope. For since we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so through Jesus, God will bring with those who have fallen asleep. So we celebrate and recognise the reality of the Lord's Supper. He was in three days and three nights in the grave. He was resurrected bodily. He ascended back to the Father. And Jesus is returning. Verse 15, For this we declare to you by the word from the Lord, not my opinion, not my thought, from the, directly from the Lord, that we who are alive, who are left until the coming of the Lord, will not precede those who've fallen asleep. So I like that sense of messianic expectation. And I think the reason this is recorded is that all faithful people live as if Jesus is going to return tomorrow. Can I ask, can I ask you a question? If you knew that Jesus was returning tomorrow, how would you live differently today? And Scripture says Jesus will appear at a time when you least expect not, like a thief in the night. Whoa, I didn't expect it. And we, last week we covered the story about the ten maidens. They all fell asleep waiting for the groom to come, picturing Jesus. And they all trimmed their lamps and half had no Holy Spirit. You know the story. Verse 16 is very interesting. For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with three things, the cry of command, the voice of an archangel, and the trump, some sound of the trumpet of God. So the three things there, and I think, why is it listed three things? The cry of command, the voice of an archangel, and the sound of the trumpet. The cry of, the command, the cry of command is really, Jesus on earth said, only the Father knows when he would return, not even the angels in heaven. So when the Father says, Son, go, that's the cry of command. The voice of an archangel. When well, you think, why does it need the voice of an archangel to precede Jesus? Who, which archangel? There's Michael and Gabriel. Well, which was the archangel that came on Jesus' birth? It was Gabriel who came to Mary. It was Gabriel who spoke to Joseph in a dream. So perhaps it'll be Gabriel preceding the voice of an archangel and the sound of the trumpet of God. Now, in history time, a trumpet was either two things. It was a ram's horn that was a shofar. Many other times I've played it by, um, on an MP3. Today I've taken the liberty of doing that. But they also had silver trumpets. This one is gold-plated or bronze-plated, whatever it is. To give an idea of warning, of battle, of alarm, of, of a siren. And then the dead in Christ will rise first. That's awesome. You know, I look forward to that. Um, in 2009, this building here was commemorated in March 2009. So we are blessed to worship here. In December 2009, my mum died after spending three and a half years in a nursing home. She lays at rest in a cemetery, the Pinaroo Cemetery. And every now and then I go and stand there in silent contemplation looking forward to the dead in Christ rising first. This is why it's so personal to me. Towards the, a month before my mum died in the nursing home, she, she, taught, she was always trying to teach me Greek words because she came from Greece. And as a small boy, I didn't want to learn Greek. It meant nothing to me. But she taught me one more word, anastasis. I might pronounce it wrong. In English, it's anastasia. It's the Greek word for resurrection. The last Greek word that she taught me was resurrection because that's what she looked for. And she said, John, I'm looking forward to rest now and just sleeping. She had hope. And on her gravestone is asleep until the resurrection in bronze there. And then Paul says, it brings us back to the moment, if Jesus returns in our lifetime, then we who are alive, who are left, will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. So we will always be with the Lord. When Jesus said, I go and prepare a place for you, and when I return, I will take you to be with me where I am. And then Paul says in verse 18, Therefore, encourage one another with these words. Isn't that powerful? Isn't that reassuring? Doesn't that make you want to change your life now because Jesus will come and find us at an unexpected moment? To me, it's very powerful. The last trumpet will sound 
and the dead in Christ will be raised. You know, can I ask you, do you love Jesus? Because I came from a background that was very stoic. You never expressed love for Jesus. You say, oh, you know, you must love God with all your heart, mind, soul and strength. But can you personally say, because I can personally now say, I love Jesus. Because I know he loves me and I know he loves all of us. And Jesus says, he who confesses me before men, I will confess before my Father in heaven. And he who denies me before men, I will deny before my Father in heaven. So we've got to be a little bit more open. Oh, I have to. It's been a long journey for me to say, I love the Lord Jesus with all my heart and mind and soul and strength. But I also pray, I go before God, it's my most often prayer, Lord, how long before Jesus comes? How long before I see my maker? How long, O Lord? And this kind of longing is not something to be embarrassed about, saying, oh, well, yeah, you know, wishful thinking. It's based because the book of Hebrews says, fix your eyes on Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith. So everything that we are around now as ambassadors of Christ, as, as ministers of reconciliation, you know, this kind of yearning is also modelled on Jesus' prayer. Remember when he's teaching his disciples to pray? He, and they said, our Father in heaven, holy be your name. Then he said, thy kingdom come. Your will be done on earth as is done in heaven. And if you watch the evening news, I don't watch it anymore because it's too painful to watch the sinfulness and brokenness of a world sinking into a moral abyss. Thy kingdom come. Your will be done on earth as is done in heaven. You know, the light of Christ in us accentuates the darkness of the world in which we live. And amidst a wicked and sinful world, we live in a, in a very sick world, a very broken world. And it's only the Holy Spirit that reminds us. John was in exile on the Isle of Patmos when the Lord Jesus gave him the book of Revelation. And he signs off. He says, come quickly, Lord Jesus. Even so, come quickly. And you know that's our prayer today. Lord Jesus, come quickly. Now if I go back to the first chapter of Acts, we see the disciples in Galilee staring up at the sky. And two angels appeared. And the two angels told them something of the future. Now, if two angels appeared to you and said, um, Leah, boo, oh, oh, because we'd all like to know what the future is. We'd like to know, I'd like to have a vision of myself in 10 years' time. But then I'd try to play with time, matter, and space if you watch Dr. Who at every time. So if I turn to Acts chapter 1, verse 9, when Jesus had said these things, they were looking on as he was lifted up and a cloud took him out of their sight. That's the end of three and a half years' ministry with them. He had been resurrected. He was with them for 40 days after the resurrection. And now he's lifted out of their sight. In verse 10, while they were gazing into heaven as he went, two men stood beside them in white robes. And you think, well, why are there two men? It turns out they're two angels. Well, those two appears with Jesus elsewhere. You know when Mary Magdalene turned up at the tomb and Jesus was gone? There were two angels sitting there, one at the head and one of the, at the foot where Jesus was laid. There's those two angels. Go back to Abraham over the story of Sodom and Gomorrah. The Lord and two angels come with him. And I talk to Abraham and they have a meal and then the Lord talks about the future of Sodom and Gomorrah. And the angels go down into Sodom and Gomorrah, etc. So there's these two angels and, and they say something. They say, men of Galilee... Why do you stand looking into heaven? Now that's very interesting because they're speaking not their own words. They're speaking on behalf of the Lord. And many times the Lord Jesus Christ asked a question. And so he, they're doing two things here. First they identify, you are men of Galilee. You are men of the earth. Well, I know who you are, but what are you staring up into heaven? So you see the connection between the earthly and the heavenly, and the question that ties the two together. This Jesus who has taken you from heaven will come in the same way as you saw him go into heaven. That's a powerful promise. As Luke pens it in the first chapter of the book of Acts, it forms part of the basis is, come Lord Jesus, come quickly, hasten that day. And we read elsewhere in scripture, it talks about Jesus Christ's return at the last trumpet, the dead in Christ will rise, and it says that every eye will see him when Jesus returns. That he'll come with a surprise factor, that the nations will mourn his coming, they'll gather for battle, and they'll experience Armageddon defeat. Broad brushstrokes of the biblical narrative to help us to be aligned to Jesus today in a very powerful way. And we also see that those who've ministered who've endured, who've suffered, who have 
been protected from the, the rigors of tribulation, are raised to glory at Jesus' return. You know, we can barely comprehend the joy because you and I get up Monday morning and we go off to work and, and, we, and we have a coffee at 10 o'clock in the morning and we come home and we start the same cycle again the next day and then you get arthritis in your arm and a, and a bee sting in your foot and that's the material life in which we live and we try to care for one another and pray for one another. The idea of what's promised to us, and Apostle Paul wrestled with that when he wrote to those in Corinth, he says in 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 9, As it is written, what, I ha- what no eye has seen, nor ear heard, nor the heart of man imagined, what God has prepared for those who love him. But Paul then says, God has revealed it to us through the Holy Spirit. He gives us a little down payment of his Spirit, sufficient to whet our appetite, so that we are endeared to the idea of paradise. You know, when the the, the crucified criminal was on the cross and he says, Lord, remember me when you come to your kingdom. Jesus, I say to you today, you will be with me in paradise. Holy, 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 holy. take you um, to the idea of resurrection, some of the oldest times that we know. If we go back to um, Job, one of the oldest texts that we have, Job says something. He asks a question and he says, if a man dies, shall he live again? All the days of my service, I would wait till my renewal come. You would call and I would answer you and you would long for the work of your hands. Job is a man who's if you understand the story of Job, man suffering. And the greatest thing that any of us can do is ask a question. Lord, when are you coming? That's the best question that I can ask. But Job says, if a man dies, shall he live again? He knew renewal was coming. And he knew that God would call him and he would answer and God would be glad for the fulfilment of the work in his life. But the thing is, you know, just like God called Lazarus from the grave, Lazarus come forth and a certified dead man walked from the tomb. So Job had that hope. But he was speaking from suffering, profound suffering. And I don't think, you know, when you're, when you, you, Job said things that he probably regretted later, but he spoke from his heart. And we read with him as a man that's broken. You know, when you're broken, you don't understand what's happening. He didn't realise he was part of a greater convict, cosmic conversation. He was confused. Because he suffered what you and I have never materially really suffered. You know, in a single day, he lost his 12 children by a freakish whirlwind. Now, some of us have lost children, but not 12 children in one moment. He lost all his livestock. He lost all his employees by one. If you listen to the narrative, he was alienated from the one who was closest to him, his wife. She said, just curse God and die, because he saw his suffering. Later he sat on an ash heap, covered in boils and lamenting the pain and the suffering going through. And he asked these questions, you know, they're big questions. You know, Jesus speaks to us 
in the leading up to the time of your return. He said to his disciples, in this world, you will have trouble. That's why he prayed, Father, lead us not in temptation and deliver us from evil. You and I have not experienced the level of depth and despair to the point of losing 12 children. I just can't understand it. That's why a lot of people say Job never existed. It was a Hebrew mythology that permeated the scriptures. Well, Jesus mentions Job, and Job is mentioned elsewhere in scripture as a genuine figure who really lived. I put that there out there. You know, each of us have suffered, though, to varying degrees. And if we wanted to have testimonies of how we've suffered for the name of Christ, we probably could fill this afternoon talking about our suffering journey in this world and the things that we've given up and the things that we've suffered unjustly because of the name of Jesus. But the reason we suffer and pain mostly today is because living in a broken world and we see the penalty of sin and brokenness in people's lives in selfish decisions, in wicked decisions, where in our society today is characterised by Job lost his 12 children, but today's society, abortion takes the most vulnerable and weakest from among us, and it's, want, it's done in a wanton manner. Do you think God's visitation on the earth is due? Yes, it is. The cry from Sodom and Gomorrah was great, and the Lord and his two angels came down to inspect and judge. You know, Jesus... Jesus described, lays the blame on Satan because he said Satan was a liar and a murderer from the beginning. And it was the spirit and the handiwork of the Satan that took away Job's 12 children on that terrible freakish windstorm, on that terrible sad day. And today it's the same spirit of wickedness that puts it in the heart of men to take the lives of innocent children. You know, we hear about Black Lives Matter. More black babies have been killed and murdered as a result of abortion than any other race of people. That's, where, well, that's what we should be lamenting, these little children. But I know, before we get too sad and feel the pain, that Jesus is coming. And Jesus is King. And Jesus is Lord. And he calls himself the judge of the living and the dead. And today we celebrate that. And today we have extraordinary hope. Paul talks about this hope when he talks in, in, um, in Romans 8 verse 18. For he said, I consider that the sufferings of this present time, the suffering of Job, the suffering as we see the brokenness carried out in this world, are not worth comparing with the glory that is to be revealed in us. Brothers and sisters, hold on to that. Hold on to that dearly, for the creation waits with eager longing for the revealing of the sons of God. First, Jesus had to come. And the greatest point in the whole of history was when the virgin gave birth to Jesus and when he was crucified and he took upon himself our sins. And then now we are all declared righteous. The next great moment, as Paul says, is everything in creation points to that moment. When we will be resurrected to share fellowship with Jesus forever. Forever. The appointed time is coming and today we celebrate. Today we focus on the victory we have in Jesus. Today we celebrate the imminency of his return. And today we proclaim, brothers and sisters, covenantal faithfulness to endure to the end, no matter what happens. Whether we experience what Job did, God forbid, to stand before the Son of God and the Son of Man on that glorious day. Praise God for that hope. This is what we proclaim. So that's why I say, blow the trumpet, sound the horn, Cry a crowd from the rooftops. Jesus is king. And brothers and sisters, the king is coming. Hallelujah. I want to finish with a scripture. Watch therefore, from Luke 21 verse 36 says Jesus, and pray that you may be accounted worthy to escape these things. The chapter in Luke is a parallel of Matthew 24. To escape these things that come to pass and to stand before the Son of Man. So brothers and sisters, live today like Jesus is coming tomorrow. Holy, holy.